Welcome to the deep dive. We're all about taking interesting topics and, you know, really breaking them down so you get the essential knowledge fast. And surly. Exactly. Today, we're digging into propagating blueberry bushes. This came up because uh, Steen got really interested in cloning plants from cuttings. Right, after seeing some videos online. Yeah, and it led to this great chat we had at the garden center with, well, let's call him the man in the green shirt. He was super knowledgeable. He really was. So our mission today is basically to unpack everything we learned from him about getting blueberry cuttings to root successfully. We'll be focusing on rooting hormones, but also, surprisingly, soil pH and its whole backstory in North America. Yeah, the Garden Center talk was like packed with practical tips. And Steen was definitely zeroed in on those rooting hormones, what they are if you really need them for blueberries. So maybe yeah. that's the place to start. Good idea. So first things first. What do these rooting hormones actually do? Well, the man in the green shirt explained them basically as helpers. They encourage the cuttings, those little branches you snip off to start developing roots. Okay. He said they're particularly useful for plants that are, you know, a bit slow or difficult to root on their own. Kind of gives them a nudge. Right. And it's not some kind of magic, is it? He mentioned the active ingredients are synthetic auxins. Yeah, exactly. Mostly something called indole-3-butyric acid, IBA. IBA, right. And sometimes another one. NAA nathalene acetic acid. They essentially mimic the plant's natural hormones that signal grow roots now. So you're just like amplifying the plant's own signal? Pretty much. You're telling the cutting, okay, forget about leaves for a sec. Focus on making roots so you can drink. It helps bypass some of that initial shock, you know? Makes sense. And remember that funny moment when he said hormones? This woman nearby with her kid just sort of backed away. Ah, yeah, I remember that. It immediately made me think, okay, safety. Are these chemicals something we need to worry about, especially with kids around? That's a really fair question. And you asked him directly, right? Yeah. About the safety aspect. I did. Because, you know, you don't want to bring anything iffy into your garden. He was pretty reassuring, actually. Said that IBA and NAA, when you use them like you're supposed to for cuttings, tiny amounts, really the risk to people is very low. But he did have caveats, didn't he? Oh, yeah. Definitely wear gloves. Don't breathe in the powder. Keep it out of your eyes. You know, standard precautions you'd take with any garden product. He even made a little joke about some uh, YouTube gurus maybe not being so careful. Good advice. They aren't carcinogenic or anything, but they can irritate your skin or, you know, airways if you're not careful. Simple precautions make sense. Absolutely. And the bottom line for kids and pets is just follow the label, store it properly. Okay. Always the best bet. For sure. Okay, so back to the actual blueberries. Steen really wanted to know... Are these hormones essential for the big American ones? Vaccinium corymbosum. Ah, uh, the necessity question. He explained that while you can root them without hormones, it's yeah. possible, but it takes longer and it's definitely less reliable. He mentioned commercial growers pretty much always use IBA, especially for semi-hardwood cuttings in summer. Something like 0.3 to 0.8% concentration. Okay, so for commercial scale, it's about efficiency and consistency. Makes sense. But what about, like, us? Home gardeners just wanting a few extra bushes. That's where it gets more interesting for us, I think. He really stressed that you can get good results without hormones if you get the conditions right. Conditions like? High humidity was a big one. Good drainage so they don't rot. Acidic soil, that low pH is crucial. Worn soil. Mm. And patience. Ah, patience. The secret ingredient. And he had a tip for the humidity part, right? Something about a mini greenhouse. Yes. Even just a plastic bag over the pot works. And using pure sphagnum moss as the rooting medium. Why sphagnum? It holds moisture really well, but also stays airy, which roots need. And the enclosed space, the mini greenhouse effect, keeps humidity super high so the cutting doesn't dry out before it makes roots. That makes total sense. Keep the moisture in, give it time to work on the roots. Okay, so summing up the hormone thing. Helpful. Increases odds, especially for speed and reliability. But not strictly essential if you nail the environment. Right. And he even encouraged experimenting without them, which is cool. Yeah, definitely worth a try for the home setup. Which kind of flows right into the next big topic, soil pH. You know, you hear about plants needing different soils, and it got me thinking about, like, American plants versus European plants. Are there general differences? That's a really sharp observation. And yet you're onto something. The man in the green shirt pointed out that a lot of North American native species, he mentioned the riverbank grape, Vitus riparia, and our blueberries, Vaccinium corymbosum, they're adapted to soils that are more acidic and have more organic matter compared to many typical European species. And for these American blueberries, 
how acidic are we talking? Is it just slightly acidic? No, it's pretty significantly acidic. The ideal range he gave was pH 4.5 to 5.2. Whoa, okay. 4.5 to 5.2. It's way lower than most garden soils, right? He said typical soil is more like 6.0 to 7.5. Exactly. And that's the problem. If you try to grow them in soil with a pH above, say, 5.5, they really start to struggle. Struggle how? The main issue is nutrient availability, specifically iron and manganese. At higher pH levels, these micronutrients get chemically locked up in the soil. They become less soluble, so the plant's roots just can't absorb them effectively. And that leads to... Chlorosis, usually. The leaves turn yellow because the plant can't make enough chlorophyll without that iron and manganese. It's a classic sign of pH trouble in blueberries. Yellow leaves. Okay, noted. So if your soil isn't naturally in that magic 4.5 to 5.2 window, you have to acidify it. What were the options he suggested? He mentioned things like adding sphagnum peat moss, which is naturally acidic, or elemental sulfur that gets converted to acid by soil bacteria or even compost made from pine needles. They all help lower the pH over time. Gotcha. So, lar pH non-negotiable. But then he also talked about soil warmth, especially for rooting cuttings. Why is warmth so important, down below? Right, bottom heat. He recommended keeping the root zone around 21 to 24 degrees Celsius. That's like 70 to 75 Fahrenheit. Even if the air is cooler. Yeah, the air can be cooler, maybe 15 to 18 C or 60, 65 F. This temperature difference is key. The warmth down low encourages the cells in the burying part of the cutting to divide and form callus tissue. That's where roots emerge from. Ah. Uh. But the cooler air helps prevent the top part, the leaves, from losing too much water before the roots are ready to supply more. So you're pushing root growth while conserving water up top? Smart. Did he have a simple way to achieve that at home? Yeah. Pretty neat DIY setup. He suggested a heat mat, like the ones for starting seeds. Okay. Put that under a styrofoam box. The box insulates. Inside the box, you have your little pots with cuttings and sphagnum. It keeps that root zone consistently warm. Simple, effective. Any temperature warning? Well, yeah, he stressed not letting the root zone drop below 18 Celsius, or about 65 Fahrenheit. Below that, root growth just slows right down or stops. Okay, so for rooting cuttings, especially without hormones, it sounds like the trifecta is low pH, high humidity, and warm roots. That's pretty much the formula. And Steen was all fired up about getting a thermostat-controlled heat mat for the garage lab. Ah, sounds like a plan. You know, your comment earlier about more organic soil in North America, yeah. that ties right into this whole pH and history thing the man of the green shirt was explaining. Right, because wild blueberries often grow in these forests where the soil looks really dark and rich. What does more organic mean in that context? It means the soil is high in humus, that dark, spongy stuff from decomposed plants. Mm. In North American blueberry habitats, especially where coniferous forests dominate, you get loads of decomposing needles and wood. This process naturally creates soil that's acidic, drains well, and is low in lime. Basically, perfect blueberry conditions. And he linked this to, like, really deep history, ice ages and forests. It's exactly. After the last Ice Age glaciers retreated, huge parts of northern North America were colonized by coniferous forests. These forests sat there for thousands of years. Okay. And over that time, specific soil types developed, like podzols. They're characterized by being acidic, not super rich in minerals like calcium, but having these thick layers of slowly decaying organic stuff, lots of fungal activity, just layer upon layer of acidic organic material building up. Wow. So a really specific environment shaped over millennia, and he yeah. contrasted that with Europe. Yeah. He pointed out that while Europe obviously has forests too, a lot of the underlying rocks, especially in Central Europe, comes from old seabeds. Seabeds, meaning lime. Exactly. Calcium carbonate. And geological activity, like mountain building, push these lime-rich layers closer to the surface in many places. So European soils, on average, tend to be more neutral or even alkaline. Which explains why different plants evolved to prefer different conditions, like European wine grapes or herbs liking that slightly higher pH, maybe 6.0 to 7.0. Precisely. It's all about what they adapted to over generations. It's a beautiful illustration of how geology, climate, and biology all weave together he even mentioned Darwin. Ah, Darwin and the earthworms, the formation of vegetable mold. That's the one. While Darwin was focused on the worms, the man in the green shirt was using it to highlight how these big geological and historical differences shape the very ground plants grow in, influencing which species thrive where. It's fascinating. And then Steen, connecting the dots, brought up earthworms again in the North American context. That adds another layer, doesn't it? It really does. The earthworm story in North America is... Uh, 
pretty unique and directly impacts the soils we're talking about, especially for blueberries. So what's the deal with earthworms there? Well, remember the glaciers covering northern North America? Yeah, wiped everything clean. Including any native earthworms north of where the ice reached. So for thousands of years after the ice melted, the forests in places like Minnesota, Wisconsin, southern Canada, they grew without earthworms. Forests without worms. That's hard to imagine. What did that do to the soil? Without worms constantly mixing things up and pulling leaves down, that layer of dead stuff, needles, leaves, twigs, just piled up on the forest floor. It decomposed very slowly, creating a thick, acidic, peaty layer. Rich in humus, but low in minerals like calcium. Basically the perfect acidic seedbed for blueberries. Wow. So the lack of worms actually helped create the ideal blueberry soil? In a way, yes. It contributed significantly to those acidic, organic, rich conditions. Yeah. And the punchline is, earthworms only really came back to these areas in the last few hundred years. How? Humans. Mostly European species hitching rides on plants brought by settlers, in soil used as ballast in ships, discarded fishing bait, things like that. They're essentially introduced species yeah. in those northern forests. And now that they're back... They're changing things big time. They're doing what earthworms do. Mixing soil layers, breaking down that thick organic mat much faster, and generally making the soil less acidic, raising the pH. Which sounds good generally, but maybe not for the native plants. Exactly. For plants that evolved over millennia in those acidic, worm-free conditions like blueberries, some native orchids, other specialist plants, this change can be really disruptive. It makes it harder for them to compete and thrive as the soil chemistry shifts away from what they're adapted to. So even something seemingly beneficial like earthworms can have complex, even negative effects depending on the ecosystem's history. It really underscores how connected everything is. Absolutely. And it brings us right back to why pH isn't just some minor gardening detail for blueberries. It's fundamental to whether they can actually get the food they need. Right. It's not just about the soil feeling right. It's about the chemistry allowing nutrient uptake. Precisely. pH basically governs the solubility of micronutrients. Mm. In alkaline soil, as the man in the green shirt explained, essential things like iron, manganese, zinc, copper, they get chemically bound up, locked away. He mentioned how that happens chemically. You followed up with Professor Hendricks on that, right? We did. Professor Hendricks explained that in alkaline conditions, there are more hydroxide ions, OE, floating around. These react with positively charged nutrients like zinc ions, Zen OU. Okay. They form zinc hydroxides, Zen OH, which doesn't dissolve well in water. It precipitates out as a solid. So the zinc is there, but it's not in a form the plant can absorb from the soil water. Locked up. And it wasn't just hydroxides, carbonates too. Right. Especially in soils with lots of lime, huh. calcium carbonate. The carbonate ions, a buoy no, can react with zinc to form zinc carbonate, Zen Angero, also very insoluble. So same result, different reaction. The zinc iron, manganese, copper, they get stuck in these solid forms when the pH is too high. Exactly. That's a primary reason blueberries just fail to thrive in lime-rich alkaline soils. The nutrients are physically present, but chemically unavailable to the plant. That is such a key point. It's not that the soil is empty, it's that the plant can't access what's there because of the pH. Which is why those nutrient availability charts you see in gardening books are so useful. Yeah, describe this again. They show pH. They typically show pH along the bottom, maybe from 4 to 9. And then for each essential nutrient, there's a band running across. The width of the band at any given TH shows how available that nutrient is. Wide band means high availability. Narrow band means low availability. And they really show visually why blueberries need that low pH, right? Because the bands for things like iron and manganese are widest down in that acidic range. Exactly. And then you see other nutrients, like phosphorus, might be most available closer to neutral pH. It visually explains why different plants have such different pH preferences based on the nutrients they need most efficiently. Makes sense. Now, Steen also brought up strawberries, remembering it like slightly acidic soil too. How does that compare? Yeah, Professor Hendricks tackled that. Strawberries do like it slightly acidic, but their sweet spot is generally higher than blueberries more like pH 5.5 to 6.5. Ah, okay. So blueberries are 4.5, 5.2, strawberries 5.5, 6.5. There's a little overlap zone. There is, right around 5.5. Professor Hendricks said you could potentially grow both at pH 5.5. But it's a compromise. It is. Because if you go much below 5.5, say below 5.0, 
The strawberries might struggle. They can have trouble picking up calcium and phosphorus at really low pH, leading to weaker plants. And if you go above 5.5, creeping towards 6.0. Then the blueberry starts suffering from that iron and manganese deficiency we just talked about. So that 5.5 zone is okay for both, but optimal for neither, especially not for the blueberries that really crave that deeper acidity. So planking them together requires careful management. What were the practical tips? Maybe plant strawberries on the edge of the blueberry patch, not right next to the bushes. And be really targeted when you amend the soil. Add the acidic stuff like peat or sulfur only right around the blueberry roots to create microzones of lower pH. Kind of managing pH on a plant-by-plant -plant basis almost. Yeah, or consider other ground covers. Maybe cranberries, which also like acid or certain legumes. Depends how much effort you want to put into managing those pH differences. Right. And looking back at those nutrient charts confirms all this, doesn't it? Iron, manganese, zinc, copper-wide bands down low in the acid range. Mm-hmm. Phosphorus peaks availability more around 6, 7. And things like calcium, magnesium, potassium become more available as pH goes up towards neutral, though imbalances can happen if it gets too high. Exactly. The chart shows availability, the soluble form the plant can actually use, not the total amount in the soil. That's why acid lovers thrive at low pH. They can access the micronutrients abundant then. And why, say, cabbage prefers a higher pH for its different nutrient needs. It all just clicks together, like the man in the green shirt said right at the end. It's all connected. The ice age, the worms, the humus, the pH, the plants, none of it is irrelevant. Perfectly put. It was a really holistic view of gardening, wasn't it? It really was. Okay, so let's wrap this up for our listeners. Key takeaways from the steep dive. First, those rooting hormones. They can definitely help blueberry cuttings root. But... They aren't absolutely essential if you provide the right conditions. That means high humidity, good drainage, really acidic soil, and bottom heat for the roots. Second, American blueberries are serious about their acidic soil. We're talking TH 4.5 to 5.2. It's not just a minor preference, it's tied to their whole evolutionary history. Third, understand that soil pH is like a master control for nutrient availability. Get the pH wrong, especially too high, and essential micronutrients like iron and manganese get locked up, unavailable to your blueberries, leading to yellow leaves and poor growth. And finally, appreciating that deep history, the glaciers, the millennia without earthworms in northern North America, the type of forests, it all shaped the unique soils these plants adapted to. The later arrival of earthworms is now changing that ecosystem. It really puts gardening in a much bigger context. It does. And maybe a final thought for everyone listening. Think about how these ideas, soil chemistry, plant evolution, historical impacts might apply to other plants you grow or are interested in, or even how human actions like introducing earthworms or changing land use continue to reshape the soil beneath us. Yeah, that hidden world under our feet has a huge impact on everything we see growing above ground. Absolutely. Lots to think about. Until our next deep dive, keep exploring.